guys, it's Lauren Yates from Rave It Up here. And today we're going to be having a chat over Zoom with Australian performer Ainsley Mellon. You may remember him from Aladdin the Musical and Pippin the Musical, as well as High Five back in 2013. We have a chat about both those shows and High Five, as well as go back to his childhood and talk about how he found his love for performing and also how he got through bullying and how he gets through haters now, as well as chat about him co-founding the charity We The Industry. There's so much to cover, so let's get into it now. Ainsley, welcome to Rave It Up. It is a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you going? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. You're very welcome. As we said before we started recording, we were supposed to do this in place face to face, but it's supposed to, you know, raining all today and we're supposed to do it outside, but hopefully in the future we can do it face to face as well. But I have yeah, been so really looking forward to this. So I appreciate you taking the time, especially with the whole moving house this weekend. <laughs> of course, of course. I know for those who are listening, we've been moving house, but we're in, we're settled. And now I'm happy to be here chatting with you. Oh, well, it's good. I'm giving you a bit of a break from, you know, emptying boxes and stuff. <laughs> Now, since this is your first time on the show, Ainsley, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and start from the beginning of your whole journey, if that's okay, to get a good idea of how you've made it to where you are today. So when I was, uh, I, I really wanted to know, because I've been doing a bit of research online and sometimes, you know, some things online are true and some are not. I really wanted to know from you, how did you originally find your love for entertainment and performing? Was it through your family or friends or just from going to musicals as a kid? Yeah, I think it was definitely uh, inspired first at home with my family. When I was growing up, um, my father and I used to sit down and watch old black and white films. Uh, and that's because I used to love uh, the music of the era. And I also used to love tap dancing. It was something that I started when I was very, very young. So I used to sit and watch with him all of those beautiful musicals with Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire and Donald O'Connor. And they're doing these beautiful um, tap routines. And, and and of course, the beautiful women of that era, um, uh, Ann Miller and um, Ginger Rogers, just, just stunning. So I think that's where my love for musical theater particularly first was born um, and then you know it, it grew from there throughout my childhood and, and obviously into my career. So did you ever think of it as a career as well or was it more like a hobby starting out and did you have other careers in mind? Yeah I think uh, I always knew that I loved it I always knew inside deep down that oh I wish I could do this you know for the rest of my life but I, I guess I'd never really knew if that was possible, never really understood if, if that was a solid career path. Um, and that knowledge only came uh, very close to, to the end of my schooling. When I was graduating, somebody said to me, you know, if you want to do this as a career, you should go to this school, this school, this school. And they laid out a list in front of me. And, and that's sort of how my journey started uh, professionally. But but yeah, I always knew uh, from a very young age that this is something that I loved and I wanted to do. Great. So no plan Bs as, as they call it. <laughs> you know, I always thought I was like, oh, maybe I could do psychology. Uh, I was always really good at maths at school. So I was like, mm, maybe I could become a teacher. I mean, I'm terrible at maths now. So uh, <laughs> clearly <laughs> out of practice, but um, keep it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were some other things that were sort of floating around, but none, none really sort of uh, lit a spark in me like performing did mm, that's when you know it's a passion when you just that's can't, right. yeah i can't imagine yourself doing anything else i'm kind of the same with interviewing like i couldn't imagine myself doing anything else so yeah, yeah something we have in common <laughs> yeah, when i was doing my research on you and correct me if i am wrong with i did hear that your dad didn't want you to dance when you were younger and i'm sure there are actually a lot of boys listening today that might actually relate so how did you get over that and decide to follow your dreams no matter what? You know, some people find it so hard to not take what their parents or some other loved ones say on board. But, you know, it is your life after all, isn't it? You're just going to make sure you're happy. Yes, I have to say I was I was very, very lucky. There is a story that my mother tells when I was very young that she said to, to my dad, oh, he's always moving around the room when I put music on, he's bopping around, maybe we should put him into dance lessons. And dad was like, oh, no, I don't really, I don't know, I don't know about it. Mum was very adamant, so she put me into lessons. <clears throat> and then once dad saw how much enjoyment I got from it, 
He was absolutely on board. So I had his support from very early on. There may have been some hesitation at the start, but I, but I, but I do want to put that out there that he, that he has been uh, my number one supporter and used to um, sew costumes for me when I was uh, competing and, and you know, was, is, was always there with me uh, at competitions. It would be me and my father and, and all the other lovely um, young girls and their mothers. So we were like the odd pair in, in these comp in competitions. Um, but yes, I understand, uh, you know, a lot of my peers have been in situations, have grown up in situations where perhaps they don't have that wonderful support. Um, and that can be really challenging. But as you said, it, it is it is it is your journey. It is your your life and your passion. Um, it can be hard to follow when there are those external pressures trying to tell you not to do that or go elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> but I would like to think that think that that spark, that essence always sort of like shines through somewhere you know no, no matter what you end up doing mm. well yeah you definitely hear so many stories of people just going down the path of whatever job or career that their parents are doing because either they've been pressured to do that or they feel like they have to but it's right. so good that yeah you went down that different path and it looks like your dad is one of your number one fans now right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it just turns you know 180 doesn't it right. <laughs> And times are changing, but I do think, unfortunately, you know, not fast enough. Boys are still getting criticised and bullied for dancing or, you know, not being so-called, you know, manly enough. And in a Channel 10 story that I watched when you were doing Aladdin, um, your mum did say that you were bullied as a kid, but it was kind of like water off a duck's back, as they say. Is that true for you or did you kind of get it, you know, did it go internally in you and yeah look i think um it does affect you but i think that statement is is relatively true um i never let it um deter me mm. no matter what anybody else said I, I was always involved with the the arts department at school you know i was i was up there singing and performing and part of the school musicals and part of the choir at mass and all this sort of stuff uh, you know, and I used to get some flack for that, but I think, in, again, in comparison to probably what some of my peers have experienced or, you know, what some others experience out there, I think my, I was very lucky and, and I did, I did, you know, receive some pushback, but um, I had a lot of support around me and that allowed me just to um, let it go, let it slide off and, and, and I could, uh, you know, move forward. It's not always easy, though. It's not always easy to do that when you have, again, when you have those external pressures and, and your peers, friends, perhaps, you know, uh, giving you a bit of flack for it. But um, I mean, now today, <clears throat> male dancers, there is so much strength and, and, and artistry in, in dance, especially for men. Um, you know, some, some of they, they, their bodies are uh, comparable to an athlete. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I think it is... It is the definition of masculinity when you see a, a wonderful, strong male dancer up there um, on the stage. Yeah, definitely. And we do need you on stage too. It can't just all be women. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they need both. You need to make sure we're representing everybody, which is great exactly. to see. Yeah. And I'm guessing, especially now that your career has been, you know, up and up and up, I swear you just keep getting better and better and getting better and better roles. But now on the other side of things, you know, it, instead of bullying at school, now we've got social media and I'm sure, you know, it. I've spoken to heaps of people in musical theatre and it is definitely some something that they all go through is haters and bad comments online. So do you do the exact same thing that you did when you were a kid and just kind of focus on the people that do support you and water off a duck's back as they say i love that phrase i'm just going to keep saying yeah. it <laughs> yeah it, it is again it's tricky i, I feel like as you mentioned the, the further you go and, and you you have these little successes and and you're building a career the, the further and the deeper you get into it the more pressure you feel is on is on your shoulders because yeah, you're you, more in the spotlight i guess people start knowing your name and know the music yeah, i guess and and you've, and you've built a reputation and you don't want to um you, you don't want to let that down you you want to you want to live up to that reputation so uh that pressure can be sometimes you know quite demanding um and then you know add that to what you're talking about with social media and and and, and perhaps some negativity that comes through that um you know i i think social media 
is is a, is a wonderful thing it connects us all but obviously there are some cons about it as well and so we have to do our best in our industry to uh to really differentiate between what's what's healthy what's real uh you know on that platform and um and just and just take those take those bits away that you, that you want to take and, and leave the rest you know yeah um but um no look I, I i do love social media because it connects me with with our industry across across the planet and um you know i have wonderful friends now in new york and london from when i was over there and uh you know we can stay in touch and and our industry feels like a global industry as opposed to just an australian indus- industry yeah and i think there's a difference between taking the constructive criticism and and just the haters that are probably having a bad day and they just want to complain right. about something <laughs> right exactly yeah. you're never going to please everyone by no, any means very very subjective so you know you just you just live with that <laughs> yeah just focus on the fans the people who do love you <laughs> and you've also studied at WAPA which is a huge performing arts school that you know so many musical theater stars have studied at I swear most of you have <laughs> And you also did the NIDA open program and you went to La Belle School of Dance. You were born in Bathurst though, which is, you know, quite a small town. How was that transition for you from Bathurst to, you know, a major city like Perth when you were going to study at Wapa? Yeah, it was it was really exciting. I, I feel like when I had got to that point where I was accepted into Wapa, I just finished my schooling. I felt like I was sort of at the point uh, uh, I had achieved most of what I could have achieved in Bathurst in terms of performing in our industry. Um, I had some wonderful, wonderful tutors and teachers there who I, I would not be here um, today without them. Um, and they certainly formed the foundation of, of, of who I am today as a performer. Um, but then I needed to go uh, further and, and Perth and Wapa was the perfect place to do that. And Wapa, um, Perth, rather, the city was like a, a lovely transition between Bathurst and let's say like Sydney and Melbourne, because mm. I feel like Perth is a little bit more chilled out. It's a little bit more relaxed, or at least it was when I was there. <laughs> so it was like this nice in between of like really fast paced city and really slow country town and Perth sort of lived in the middle um, and it had the best of both worlds. So it was a nice transition for me just personally moving out of home. Uh, you know, and, and going to uni uh, and then eventually coming back to Sydney and Melbourne. Was that was that the first time out of Bathurst as well? Not out of Bathurst, but it was certainly the first time living out of home. It was the yeah. first time living in the city. Um, by yourself. <laughs> yeah, by myself. Uh, and yeah, so there, there was all of those wonderful, exciting things and challenges to deal with. Yeah, only makes you stronger though and grows you as a person. <laughs> And from 2013 to 16, you were a member of High Five. Now, when I did read this, I was so excited to talk to you about it. When did this (laughs) opportunity all come about for you? Were you already doing musical theatre at the time? And what made you want to take that opportunity over musical theatre? So this happened basically as soon as I graduated, I was really, really lucky. Oh, good timing. <laughs> we were doing, it was very good timing. We were doing our final showcase. Um, we were touring it, touring it around uh, the country. We were Perth, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, and at the same time, there was a casting brief for High Five. They were looking for new members. And it was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a toss up at the time, because as you said, I, I'd spent three years studying in music theatre and in my head, I thought, OK, I'll probably go into a musical, I'll move into the ensemble, I'll try and work my way up and do what most people do in terms of a career path in that in that industry. Um, and then this opportunity came along and it was attractive in terms of full time employment, you know, a yeah. steady income. At the same time, we got to travel the world and we got to film a TV series. Um, so there were some really exciting things as a young performer just graduating um, that were part of this job. So, so you know, I took the job and uh, spent three years with the group. Um, and it taught me so much about myself as a performer, how to handle myself on the road, how to be uh, independent, how to work as part of a team on stage because there's five of us and, it, you know, there's no sort of uh lead role we're very much an ensemble um and uh, yeah i i think with again without that i certainly wouldn't be 
the, the performer I am today or I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. I learned a lot on that job and made some wonderful friends um, and bought my lovely apartment thanks to that. So that's good. <laughs> exactly. Yes. The great thing about these interviews is I really take you back and make you think <laughs> about all your past. <laughs> And it's good. You're grateful for it all, which is fantastic. Yeah. But lots of hard work along the way. Like I yeah, definitely yeah, lots of hard work. always notice that with all of you performers. And when you left the group, you did say you felt like it was time to trans transition back into your theatre roots. Will musical theatre always be your number one love, or is there also some other things that you want to try within the industry? You know, I think music theatre, yeah, it, it will be probably uh, at the heart of it. I don't, you know, I'd love to be on on screen. Um, I'd love to do some time there. Obviously, we filmed with High Five. Um, I filmed uh, Aladdin uh, a couple of years ago. We filmed it on stage, but I've never really been on on, on a a full set for like a, a drama or a movie or, or something like that. So I think I, I'd love to do something like that in the future. But. Uh, it always sort of leads back to, to theatre and to musicals for me. I think the, the, there's something about the music in particular that gets me um, and standing on the stage and, and having that live experience that you sort of just can't beat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a huge musical fan. Like, I totally know what you mean. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's the combination of being able to sing and then dance and it's like a play as well. It's all just, you know, mushed into one thing. It was really exciting. <laughs> And the live aspect too that i think we all really missed during COVID. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> oh my god yeah. and you did mention aladdin which a lot of people probably remember you from and you got that role just after high five and you're only what 24 at the time and you did the whole australian tour and later on broadway was that scary being a lead at you know quite a young age because this is your first yeah, lead role too wasn't it except for i guess the high five can you classify that as a lead role <laughs> yeah I, it was it there were I, I guess i was apprehensive about it you know that there's there's a lot of pressure and particularly with that show and with that uh, material because um you know it's it's coming from the disney cartoon with which many people have seen in their childhood so there's a certain nostalgia attached to that many people have wonderful stories and memories attached to that show or to that story and so they're bringing that to the musical um, which is beautiful because they're, they're coming uh, with all that beautiful history to, to to see this live show but at the same time as a performer you sort of acknowledge that that and you go oh gosh I, I hope I live up to the expectations but again I had a really wonderful team around me I had uh, Michael James Scott who was playing our genie and Ariel Jacobs who was playing Jasmine they were both performers from New York and and they had both you know performed many times in wonderful shows over there so I I had them either side of me to learn from and to support um, and so even though it, it perhaps was uh, scary I, I guess I never felt too overwhelmed because I because I had that wonderful structure around me, um, and most of all, it was fun. You know, you're like you're you're literally living a Disney uh, dream on stage. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, it, it really was a wonderful experience. I, I count myself very lucky to have uh, booked that role, that job at that time in my life. You know, sometimes these things are just about timing, about the right show coming at the right time. And certainly that was one of those cases. Yeah. Well, you definitely did a great job because you're nominated for a Helpman Award for Best Male Actor in a Musical and then won a Glug Award for Most Outstanding Performance by a Newcomer. Does that award now sit proudly in your home or did your parents want to keep it? <laughs> <laughs> My parents do have a lot of things. They have like a little, uh, when you walk into the, the, the front door of their house, they have a, a wonderful big picture of me right in the foyer. It's a bit Just like a shrine. shrine. It's a little bit weird, um, but uh, <laughs> they are very proud and, you know, and, and that makes me very happy. But yes, yeah, certainly that award, uh, that award is in one of these boxes and it will soon be on a shelf. So, <laughs> Yay, maybe that shelf yes. behind you, it's on the wall. Right, <laughs> I'm ready exactly. to showcase. Uh -huh. And how was it working with Michael James Scott as Genie? Because I think he is so funny and he like really stole the show. Incredible yeah. artist. 
he he i mean he's a wonderful performer a huge ball of energy um and yeah again just learned a lot from from um him being attached to the show being able to stand beside him on stage and because he had been uh, a part of the company uh, in new york for such a long time uh he brought a certain history uh, his own history with the show that we could learn from and you know he he told us many stories and 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 that informed what we did on stage uh so you know it's it's really exciting when you get those opportunities to um perform along alongside wonderful performers like that mm definitely it's good to learn from all those people so you can you know exactly. instead of making the mistakes yourself you just learn from them right. <laughs> they say <laughs> I also think it's safe to say that nearly everyone working in musical theatre, especially in Australia, have the dream of working on Broadway. Come on, like, that's how you know you've made it. And you have with Aladdin. So how did you not freak out every night with like nervousness because of this huge opportunity? I think because I had done the show for so long, I was able to um, sort of quell that nervous energy. But I yeah. must say that um, in my first put in, um, which is you know the the, the rehearsal essentially mm-hmm. um for Broadway Casey Nicolaw was there um and some of the Disney team were there and a few of the actors were there and obviously me this is my opportunity to rehearse a few things before I go on stage um and there was a moment when Casey uh stopped the rehearsal and called me aside and said look I just need to tell you that this is a big deal we know it's a big deal you know it's a big deal He's like, just let go of that nervous energy. Just breathe. You're making your Broadway debut. It's very exciting. And then let's continue the rehearsal. Because I think he could see that in my head, I was, you know, sort of running over this whole experience. And so, and you know, so sort of working myself up a little bit. Because even though I had done the show for so long, um, as you said, we're on Broadway now, you know? And and there was a, this was like a, a an, an added level of, uh, of pressure and, and 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 excitement and nervous energy and it was all just sort of bubbling but after he stopped and, and said that to me and it was acknowledged out loud then I could sort of breathe and and we move forward and from then it was just lots of fun wouldn't that have made it worse though it's like well thank you for reminding me I already know it's a big deal <laughs> I think I think yes that you know could have gone that way but for me it was um it calmed you down yeah, acknowledging those thoughts inside, inside and that we were able to to air that and then move forward. Because I think a lot of the time you think that that you're having a unique experience or this is just, you know, this is just you. Mm. But then you realize that probably everybody's had this experience on their first time on Broadway, you know. So yeah. uh, there's comfort in that. Yeah, that's good. It's a whole family. Yes, exactly. Said, yeah. And, you know, when we're allowed to travel again, would you like to go back over to there? Or, you know, is there things happening in the future in that department? No, I would love, I absolutely love to return. You know, there are, um, there are question marks yeah. <laughs> for the future over there. Everything is so, so, you know, so just moving around at the moment and, mm. and so, so fragile. Um, but no, certainly personally, I would love to return. And that is the plan when it is safe and, and you know, viable to do so. Yeah. Um, and when the industry is, is back and healthy. But um, we have, we have we've made some wonderful friends over there. I, I'd love to, number one, just see them. Even if it's not for work, I'd love to go back over there and see them because it's been so long. Yeah. Well, when mm. you become really huge, like Hugh Jackman or something, make sure you remember <laughs> us Australians, all right? <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. You interviewed Hugh, didn't you? Yes, I did. Oh, someone's done their research. <laughs> yes. Um, that's amazing. I'm I would, impressed. I would... Some people don't do their research on who's <laughs> going to be interviewing them, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to meet him one day, so I'm jealous that you have... Oh, you he's met. exactly who you think he'd be. Like, as soon as I met yeah. him, I'm like, oh, my God, he's so nice and, like treated everyone like a friend as soon as i walked in the room it was like he knew me already and i'm like we haven't met before but thank you like i love this <laughs> yeah if i can if i can i think i've always thought from a young age if i could emulate like a slice of him yeah then, then you know i'd be i'd be happy yeah. i always say he's like the celebrity that knows how to be a celebrity like you never see anything bad written about him in the media he just right. a normal person he just wants to have time with his family and with his wife and just yep. do this really cool job. <laughs> yeah. Right. So take a little slice of that, okay? 
At the end of last year, you were the lead in Pippin, which, you know, I'm sure everyone remembers you from, and I loved the show. Fantastic. You just, you really stole the show. You and Gabriel, like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, just, just keep it you two in the whole show. I'd be very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> very good. And this really was the show that marked the return of theatre in Australia after COVID. You guys definitely had some challenges though, like rehearsals, which normally take place in the studio, were on the actual stage. Did you actually prefer that though? Because then you actually get used to the actual stage before you go on, you know, in front of a live audience. Yeah, I think I think it was um, a double-edged sword. I mean, certainly for that show, it was probably very important because of the circus element. <clears throat> we were climbing up things. We were. Mm. Um, swinging on things, people were throwing people through the air. Um, so I think it, it, getting our bodies used to that and being able to do that on set, as opposed to having to deal with that transition from rehearsal room to stage, mm. um, that was much preferred. But in saying that, because you're on stage from the very start, you also feel like there is a performance element um, in play from the very start. So okay. usually when you're in the rehearsal room, it, it, you, you feel a little bit more cozy you yeah. feel a little safer you can explore things um and then that gradually grows as to when you get on stage but we were on stage from the very start so you were like oh my gosh i have to fill this huge space already you yeah. know and i and i'm only just learning this show um so that was an interesting um little challenge to to get our heads around Mm. And there was a lot more other challenges too, because I, I did love your Instagram post. You said you were constantly challenged by Pippin that you, and that yeah. you can tick knife throwing, pole climbing, backflipping and guitar playing all off your special skills list. Yes. Please tell us how much training was involved for this part in Pippin, because it's definitely not just a singing and dancing show. It's like a mini circus. <laughs> No, it's 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 not it is it is a mini circus it's not just straightforward um and i think the the really wonderful thing about this particular production and what i am most proud of for our cast and our team <clears throat> is that it was put on in such a short amount of time um you know usually around the world when they mount this show the pippins have a few weeks of acro training and then they'll go into about you know, anywhere between seven or eight weeks of rehearsal. Here, I had no acro training before mm. the rehearsal and we had about four to five weeks of rehearsal. So everything oh. was so condensed um, and we were all working extremely hard, you know, and, and that's and, and it was condensed because it had to be because of COVID and because of, you know, uh, budget and, and we were just trying to get theater back on the stage. Mm. Uh, and everybody worked extremely hard coming in early, staying late after rehearsals to to try and rehearse these special skills, to try and work different parts of the show, um, you know, and, and and certainly for me, I, I still felt like I was uh, working the show and 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 getting my body and my voice and and my head around the show well into the run, you know, yeah. even 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 opening night didn't feel um, polished. I was, we were still working on the show, because I think just because of the nature of it, because there is so much involved in it. Mm. Well, you definitely did a good job. I didn't see opening Thank night. You. I saw it a bit later on, so I don't know how it was at opening night. <laughs> no, it was lovely. It was By lovely. The time I saw it, it was great. <laughs> good number. <laughs> And for both Pippin and Aladdin, how did you keep in such great shape? Because for both parts, you know, you either had to take your shirt off or have quite, you know, skin showing. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to the show where I can be dressed from like here right down to my ankles. Yeah, and don't even have to worry about it. You know, I can eat cake every night. <laughs> exactly. um, they were actually very different processes. Aladdin, I had a trainer outside of the show. Um, and so I would train uh, two or three times a week and do the show and you know adhere to a a, a bit of a diet um and so that's how uh that happened in terms of the physical aspect in terms of the aesthetic of the show for pippin i sort of threw caution to the wind a little bit because we were coming out of uh COVID, out of lockdown uh, and I sort of was acknowledging, oh gosh, I've not sung or danced or, or done any of this for eight months. Um, so I already knew that my body was going to be challenged just getting back to 
the baseline. Was, where, where, yeah. yeah. And then on top of that, I thought, oh gosh, then I have to think about, you know, being half naked on stage. Um, and I guess I didn't want to add that pressure to my body also in terms of going out and training, mm. uh, you know, because I wasn't able to train consistently while we were in lockdown. So I just sort of relied on the show, to be honest with you. <laughs> and, I, and, and because of the um, circus nature of the show and the pole climbing and the backflipping and all that sort of stuff, it sort of just naturally happened, which I was very thankful for. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's amazing when you stop the show, how quickly that disappears. Yeah. And I was, I was like, oh, gosh, as soon as I stop this, you know, I'm going to have to be careful. I'm just going to roll out of roll out of here um yeah i had muscles last week and now i don't right. <laughs> um so yeah the processes were very different but they were different because i think you know uh, because of covid and because of those circumstances i really wanted to be as kind to my body as i could possibly be while mm. while also you know achieving everything i had to achieve yeah, there's always quite a big fitness element for really any musicals because you do have to yes. sing and dance sometimes at the same time. But were, were these parts totally different from anything else that you've done before? Because I'd say for anyone, you know, it would be really difficult to get stripped down on stage in front of an audience as well, unless I guess you have the best body confidence, you know? Do you nearly feel like <laughs> naked out there? <laughs> yes, you do feel weird. It does feel bizarre. It, it feels more bizarre when um i think when it's in rehearsals because you don't have the lighting and the and the world of the show doesn't exist yet mm. once the show once you're in the show and you've got lighting and everything you can sort of lose yourself in the character and in in the narrative of it and you don't focus on it so much you don't feel the lighting's as gonna make me look good <laughs> oh, yeah, cross fingers um so uh so yeah you sort of you, you do sort of let it go it, it, it's it's a learned thing it's definitely mm. a learned thing i'm i'm certainly not uh the sort of person that is uh you know although it might, might seem differently but like in my personal life i'm not particularly like yes gonna do that and be <laughs> confident you know um yeah. So that was certainly a challenge for me, but it's, it, I think it's a learned uh, habit that you sort of, you know, you learn to live with, yeah. I do like bringing that question up because it is something, you know, as an audience member, you don't really think about. You're like, you're just watching the show okay. and, you know, where with me, obviously being an interviewer, I'm like thinking of other things. I'm like, oh, how did they do that? How did they do that trick? Right. Or how much training was right. involved in that? And then it's like, oh my God, they're taking their shots off. Like, oh my God, like, how do, how do they do that? Because <laughs> I even had like, I did a couple of interviews with the the new guy, the guys in uh, Magic Mike Live at the moment here in Sydney. And I had to ask the exact same thing because I was like, you, you're you getting paid to like, just take your clothes off. And it's like, but you know, how good is your body confidence? Do you like, you know, want to hide yourself all the time? Or, you know, is it exactly like you just said in the whole, um, you know, in the show, it's a different atmosphere, you know, a bit of adrenaline rush and it's different than, you know, you know, just doing it here and now. <laughs> right, right. And do you, do you uh, get cold as well? Or are you just kind of like really heated up during the show that you're like, actually, I'm sweating right now. Let's take this shirt off. <laughs> um, yes, I think for Pippin, it was the latter. Uh, I was probably happy to, uh, you know, I had that woolen, um, like, lavender yeah, jumper long thing sleeve. On. Yeah. So, like, oh gosh, get this off me right now. Um, but I mean, it, it's always a struggle on stage because the, 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 I mean, this is a weird technical thing to talk about, but uh, they're trying to make the theater most comfortable for the audience. And so yeah. sometimes that is not always conducive for the performer because you're like, gosh, it's really warm out there or it's really cold or like, yeah. you know, they're like, no, no, we have to have it for the, you know, because the because of the house and the audience and all that. And I'm like, I know, but I'm wearing like 10 layers. Please <laughs> take it like off now. <laughs> uh, it's true though. And like, even with Aladdin, like with his outfit, you're uh -huh. out there, you know, just with the, um best sort of thing on pretty much straight uh -huh. away so it's like right. i'm not even warmed up yet and i'm freezing yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. oh well you, well you definitely do a good job i'm i'm always amazed at all the performance you performances you've done so keep up the great work and it can be such a stressful industry as i have learned from a lot of the musical theater people i've spoken to you're under oh. pressure all the time either from the people creating the show or even from yourself you know especially when you're playing a lead character and as we said with you know aladdin and even pippin being a huge show you've got a bit of a you know 
you got something to live up to, if that makes sense. So how did you get yourself into, like, get over the perfectionism and, you know, because I'm sure there's sometimes you might forget your lines or your steps and you'll be like, oh my God, like, why did I do that? I've done heaps of training. How do you get yeah. over that perfectionism? Yeah, it's really, it is really hard. I think Pippin was, um, and I, that's probably weird to say because it's most recent, but I think I've, I learned most from Pippin with regards to uh, what you're talking about, with mm. regards to letting that perfectionism go and and being okay with making mistakes or having <laughs> you know, not human. particularly wonderful performances. And then the next night, a, a much better performance. You know, you sort of start to learn how to ride, ride that wave better. And what, um, I mean, this probably sounds really horrible, but what sometimes helps me is looking <laughs> is looking to performers that I look up to, um, you know, wonderful, perhaps music theater stars from, from Broadway or around the world, you know, and, and there are stories, they tell stories or they have videos where they're, where they're talking about the mistakes they've made or, or terrible, terrible things that have happened to them or they've forgotten their lines or the, their voice hasn't come out or something. And I'm like, oh gosh, it really does happen to everybody, you know? Um, and, and then you sort of start to cut yourself some slack not only that, but you acknowledge that this is this is not really normal what we do. You know, getting out and performing eight times a week, sometimes more, and singing and dancing, and in the case of Pippin, climbing and flipping and acting and throwing knives and all of that, and doing that in front of an audience um, exactly the same way every night. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really not that normal, and and, and because we are human, um, I don't think we're really uh, made to do that the exact yeah. same way you know all the time so you sort of st you just start to live with that a little bit and you go you know it's all right if I make a mistake and I have another opportunity tomorrow to fix that and nine times out of ten the audience probably doesn't really uh clock it yeah so yeah. plus like over and over again you're probably getting more and more tired more exhausted you know especially if you're doing late shows you're not getting the best sleep as well so I'm sure especially with Pippin with all the mini circus things you gotta do you know it's uh -huh. it's just an added element of you know that there might be a mistake there yeah yeah it's part of the gig, navigating the fatigue and navigating the uh schedule that's mm. part of uh, part of the job and and you certainly and each show is different you i don't think you you ever really nail it because as soon as you move to a new show with a new set of skills then you have to recalibrate you know mm. and, and find your new routine so what do you do when you forget your lines? Is that quite embarrassing? Because it is something you've read <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> um, usually, I mean, usually you're lucky enough to have somebody else on stage to probably pick up for you or, or push you along. Um, I think it's because we've said it over and over again. That's the reason why we forget because we almost sometimes switch into um, autopilot or we or we get stuck in a particular pattern and it only takes one little thing to throw us off you know mm -hmm. and if something goes different then then you're like oh wait where, where am i what's happening um so it, it, it's a bizarre thing you, you would think that because you've rehearsed it and done it so many times you'd be fine but i think it actually is, is sort of geared the opposite um but look as, as embarrassing or or um terrifying as it might be at the time <laughs> Certainly afterwards, you have a good laugh and, and, you know, you have a good catalogue of stories that you can share with um, your fellow performers about what happened on that show. So Yeah, yeah he's a funny, embarrassing moments because, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you get into that autopilot, I'm sure there's moments where you're like, what part of the, what part of the show am I at now? <laughs> yeah. Which part What's of the that? script do I have to remember now? <laughs> yep. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, getting croaky there. <laughs> All right. And on the side of your performing career, you're also the co-founder of the charity We The Industry, which has the slogan, if you see it, you can be it. Can you please tell us more about this charity and what you do and also how can we all help? Yes. Uh, so We The Industry uh, is about um, creating better representation, greater representation within uh, the theatre industry. <clears throat> particularly music theatre, but the arts more broadly also. We, you know, we don't just focus on, on musical theatre. And, and it's about um, 
really creating pathways for young aspiring performers, particularly those you know who who might identify as people of color or um, you know they might be marginalized based on their gender or their sexuality or their um, different they might be differently abled uh, so it's about creating pathways for them uh, into our industry and making sure that they know that there are opportunities for them and that they can see um, that there are people like them in the industry you know and and, and that they can do this too um, so we're, we're relatively new charity we started we we were founded we founded the charity um, at the at the end of last year um, but we're working very hard to try and get everything in place and 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 to move forward. So we'll be excited to soon uh, open up a portal where people can donate money, hopefully, and uh, you know and support that way. But also there will be uh, you know lots of opportunities uh, to donate time or energy in other ways if you can't afford to donate money. Um, we're having lots of wonderful conversations with um, some of Australia's education institutions at the moment okay. to try and uh, kick the ball rolling, you know, and and uh, open up those pathways for our, our our young performers. And that way, you know, in a few years, we will we will hopefully see the diversity of our industry. Even though we have wonderful diversity now, we can do better, mm -hmm. um, and, and we can uh, we can open those doors and make sure that everybody has equal access. So hopefully in a few years, we will start to see that change. I love that. And just coming out of COVID, it's like the best timing, you know? I know that COVID really affected a lot of people's mental health and now they can come out of it and go, you know what, I can be anything I want to be. I can be absolutely. like Ainsley. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and that's, the, that's where our slogan comes from. If you see it, you can be it. We really believe that if you, you know, for, for all of those wonderful young performers, especially young kids, a lot of kids come to see theatre, you know, and if they see people like themselves on the stage, then they acknowledge that, oh, this is something that I can do one day, you know, and that's very powerful. So that's what we want to make sure we're creating for the future. Oh, I'm happy I brought it up and everyone can share this interview, get the word out. And then when you, when there is, um, you know, when we can donate, just let us know. And we, I'm sure that a lot of people would love to support you. It's a great Absolutely. cause. Love Appreciate it. it. Now, Ainsley, even though you've already achieved so much in your career, what else can we expect from you in the future? Do you have any plans or is it kind of all up in the air at the moment because of waiting for restrictions to ease? <laughs> It's a little bit of both. There are some, uh, again, there are some things sort of hovering, but it's it's a, it's a bit movable at the moment. But I hope to be able to, you know, block that in soon and and perhaps share it with uh, share it with everybody. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of, I guess, what I would like to do in the future, I don't really, I, you know, I, I I said before, I would love to return to the States. I would love to return to Broadway at some point. But in saying that, um, you know, uh, I it's that's not about leaving Australia because I, I love Australia so much. I love this industry. And for the, for the longest time, I've always thought, oh, I can make a career that sort of um, transitions between both, that moves between both. So, um, you know, it's not about just going over there and, and being like, see ya. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I really want to keep my connections here. And, and this is this is the country where I got my big break and and, um, and this is my home. So I want to be, be able to perform here um, well, well into my career. Um, and then on top of that, I think I mentioned earlier, I'd love to be in a film, probably a musical film. I love, you know, I, yeah, I would love that'd to be, be awesome. Something like you know, all those films that we love, like Chicago or Into the Woods or, you know, there are, there are so Showman. many. <laughs> <Greatest> <laughs> Showman. Like, Talk about Hugh Jackman before. Right. In, in the Heights is about to come out, you know, what and West Side Story probably sooner into the future. Um, yeah, all of these wonderful. See you in a West Side Story. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> One of these wonderful remakes or, or, or new new movie musicals. I'd, I'd love to be a part of that. Oh, there's heaps of them. So heaps of yeah. opportunities for you. <laughs> And I'm so glad to see that you're going to, you know, stay here in Australia as much as you can, as well as make us proud over in the States, because we love, all us Aussies love watching you on stage. So, and yeah, as I said, hopefully we can do a face-to-face -face interview in the future and, you know, you're welcome on any time. So, you know, when you make it bigger and bigger and bigger, don't forget <laughs> either. <laughs> I won't, I won't. I'll be back. Yes. <laughs> 
Now, Ainsley, I think it's time for the Rave It Up game. It's called the Two Minute Hot Seat. So Ooh. all I'm going to do is ask you questions and you just have to pick your preference. So it's like dogs okay. or cats, singing or dancing. And you have to answer as many questions in two minutes as possible. And yes, then we're going to see where you sit on the leaderboard up against everyone else that's played the game on the show. <laughs> all right. Let's no go. pressure at all. <laughs> Let me get my timer out. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> we're ready. Let's do this. Okay. Now, the person on the top of the leaderboard has answered 101 questions, and that's a lot. <laughs> That was in person and it was her second time playing it. So um, oh I don't gosh. expect you to get up that high. And because right. it's over Zoom, I'm going to give you like two minutes 15 just to make it fair because it's a okay. little bit of a delay <laughs> virtually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Are you all ready? Let's do it. Okay. Three, two, one. Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. iPhone or Samsung? iPhone. Apple or Android? Apple. Rap or rock? Rock. Rock or pop? Pop. Pop or country? Pop. Beach or mountains? Beach. Beach or pool? Beach. Skiing or snowboarding? Snowboarding. Comedy or action? Comedy. Blondes or brunettes? Oh, brunettes. Sweet or salty? Sweet. Sunglasses or hat? Hat. SUV or convertible? Convertible? Mac or PC? Mac. PlayStation or Wii? PlayStation! Singing or dancing? Singing. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Italian or Chinese food? Oh, uh, both. Italian. Summer or winter? Winter. Kim Kardashian or Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> Scarlett Johansson. Johnny Depp or Will Smith? Johnny Depp. Mall or online shopping? Mall. Cinema or home movie? Cinema. Ice cream or gelato? Ice cream. Cake or cookies? Cookies. Cookies or cookie dough? Oh, cookies. Family or friends? <laughs> Oh, family. Football or soccer? Soccer. Christmas or your birthday? Christmas. Night or day? Night. Bus or train? Train. Straight or curly hair? Curly. I color blue or brown? Blue. Vampire or werewolf? Vampire. Texting or calling? Texting. Sydney or Melbourne? Woo, Melbourne. <laughs> Friday or Saturday? Friday. TV or movies? Movies. Starbucks or Glory Jeans? Starbucks. Snow or surf? Surf. Harry Potter or Twilight? Harry Potter. Family Guy or The Simpsons? Family Guy. McDonald's or Hungry Jacks? Oh, McDonald's. Red Rooster or KFC? <laughs> KFC. French fries or chips? French fries. Burger or hot dog? Hot dog. Pies or sausage rolls? Sausage roll. Tomato sauce or barbecue sauce? Oh, barbecue sauce. And we're out of time. <laughs> I got you so excited about some of those questions. You're like, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Cookies. <laughs> it's so high because some of them I was like, oh, both. Or oh, then some of them I felt terrible picking one. <laughs> I've played it too. Someone asked me the questions. I was like, oh, my God, I have new respect for all of my guests. It's much harder than you think it is. <laughs> and some things I've never, ever thought about also. Oh, well, that's good. I really well, got cookie dough today in this interview. It was, was particularly tricky because I was like, cookie dough, my my head in that millisecond was like, I love cookies, I love cookie dough. Cookie dough usually upsets my stomach because it's not cooked. Mm, no, cookies. <laughs> so it's funny how your brain worked just then. Uh, how many questions do you think you answered in that time? Maybe like 35. Ooh, very close. You answered 49 questions. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, and you're that's sitting bad. number 39 on the Rave It Up leaderboard. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. But hey, Good. that just means you're just going to have to come back on the show in person, and then that way you can yep. answer them quicker. <laughs> And there's room for improvement. Oh, well, it's always a fun game though, right? I, I really got you really excited there. So that's uh -huh. what matters. <laughs> yeah. And we all learned something new about you too. The fans love that game because they do yeah. get to learn some fun things about you. <laughs> and we are unfortunately getting to the end of the interview, Ainsley. But as a closing statement, and was probably the most important question, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 14-year-old self? Gosh, that's fun. That's a tricky question, isn't it? What would I tell my 14-year-old self? 
it would probably be a reaffirming statement as opposed to a you know do something differently it would you know it would be like keep working hard um and and don't worry about what anybody else says um you know you can do this and there is there is there is room for you in this industry and and you have the ability you know to to achieve your dreams um which oh gosh i would like to think i thought at that point maybe mm. so maybe it's like a you know it's reaffirming that for myself at that age to be like no you can do this yeah. i love that that's very positive yeah. and probably good for all our young listeners too that you can do it there is room in the industry for you yes yeah a lot of people think it's just so competitive which it is but there is room for everybody so, you know it is. you wait for that one opportunity yeah that's right but there is room you're right and we can we can share it around yeah and yeah. if the listeners would like to contact you or find out what you're up to in the future where should they go instagram yeah, or... sure. yeah instagram's good angsley mellon on instagram or uh website angsley is also very good they're probably the two channels i frequent most i must say that i'm not a avid poster so if you are you are after content on the daily you probably won't find that from me but at least you can keep up with the uh with the updates as stuff. A, yeah you yeah. post the important that's, stuff that's what matters <laughs> yeah. and thank you so much for coming on our show today Ainsley I really appreciate your time of course thank you for having me I, I know we went over time but we we're just having so much fun so I didn't want to yes I didn't want to stop you. You're just giving us gold no. today. So thank you. But no, thanks for having me. And please keep in contact, you know, come back on the show in the future. And, you know, since we're both in Sydney, actually do one face to face one day when it's not right. pouring rain outside. <laughs> I look forward awesome. To it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed today's interview. If you'd like to check out any of our other interviews, visit our website, raveituptv.com. And also remember, our podcast, Rave It Up, is now up on all podcasting platforms. So make sure to tell your friends. And if you also haven't gotten a copy of our book yet, Knowing What I Know Now, that is also on our website, raveituptv.com. It's available in paperback and ebook versions worldwide. So go grab your copy now if you haven't already. But for now, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.